Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Check In by TMR. My guest today is the brand new president of Montecito Village Travel, Robin Sanchez. Robin's been with Montecito since 1992 and was recently promoted to president in early April. And she was one of the strongest voices for the travel industry, having spent so much time in the travel industry, having spent so much time dealing with and being a part of the travel advisory community. So I thought she'd be a great guest to talk to me sort of about where the industry stands right now. She was kind enough to take the time in the middle of a move from California to Arizona to speak with me about just that, where the industry sits including the growing segment of independent contractors across the industry and the health of the consumer heading into the summer, which is a topic a lot of people are talking about in recent weeks. Um, I wanted to get Robin's view on the future of the travel agent business. The short term pulls and pushes in demand and supply will eventually subside like they always do. But there remains questions about the future of the travel advisor and travel agency owner segment, how it's continuing to change. And I wanted to talk to Robin about that, about what skills she sees from the new people, the absence of some skills she's seeing in the industry right now, and what she sees as the driving force behind those decisions. The most interesting thread we landed on was the lack of air booking skills or experience amongst a lot of new agents and, and a lot of old agents too. Um, she talks about her own air team in Montecito and how it's looking to add more than one position that are becoming increasingly hard to fill just because it's hard to find those candidates who are qualified and experienced at booking air at a large scale. Robin was actually the third major person I've spoken to since the beginning of the year who targeted that specific need for the industry. It's something to consider if you're looking to advance your career, if you're a new entrant, if you're an old entrant and you're looking to market yourself a little better, those kind of air skills that aren't taught as much as they used to be are becoming incredibly valuable for so many hosts and corporate agencies. Having those skills or simply figuring out how to gain those skills is going to make you an incredible candidate for a lot of jobs and someone who's highly sought after by a lot of people, especially during this shift that the GDSs are making, which is something else that Robin mentions in the interview. Something else Robin mentions is her support for ASA, which is holding its legislative day next month in Washington, D.C. If you're able to get to D.C. for those days, I highly recommend it. It's, it's your chance to talk to your elected officials about what your business, your agency, your colleagues really need, what kind of support they need from the federal government, and to make your voices heard. Um, I'm going to do my best to get down there too. So if you're around and you see me, please come say hello. Um, but I want to thank Robin for taking the time to talk to me. I know how busy everyone's schedules are becoming these days. And I hope you all enjoy the conversation as much as I enjoyed talking to Robin. So let's check in with Robin. Hi, Robin. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. All your crazy travels done. Last time we talked, you were all over the place. Yeah, I was in I was in Cancun on like a uh, as a, as a part of an ALGV trip, and oh. we were like in the middle of a um, of a give back tour when when we spoke. So I was in sort of like the jungle in Cancun. Like we were like, oh, built, yeah. It was. I've, I've had, I I feel like I should do more of those kind of trips uh, as being part of the industry. But it was yeah. it was. It was a unique opportunity. It was fun to do too. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Are you in? Uh, are you in Santa Barbara right now? I'm not. So right now, I live in Arizona. I left. Oh, okay. um, I left California in February, and right now I'm living. I have a house in Tucson, um, and I'm in escrow. I'm buying something over in Maricopa. So mm -hmm. I'm like. Like you, it's just crazy times, right? And then, you know, we expected the business to come back, ramp back up, and it just came with a vengeance, bam. So, <laughs> yeah. was that a big move for you? Uh, you, you, I assume you spent a lot of time because you've been you've been in California for a long time. Is that right? Yeah, born and raised in Southern California. Um, I lived up in Santa Barbara County for 24 years, um, where I started my career at your travel center, Montecito Village Travel. And then um, I've been over in the Arizona area a lot. Um, at one point in 2004, 2005, we had five offices that we oh, had purchased wow. over here. So I spent a lot of time going back and forth. Um, you know, at one point um, in California, we had um, probably 16, 17 locations, you know, in, in the central coast, like from Ventura all the way up to San Luis Obispo. 
Um, so that, and then, you know, our presence over in Arizona, I've, I've gone back and forth a lot. So second home over here. Oh, well, it's I guess it's good to, to sort of get a change too. Um, if you spent your whole life in California. Um, but I mean, I think that happens a lot everywhere, I assume too. Well, I just, you know, I, um, I sold my house in Santa Barbara County, uh, I don't know, like three years ago, and I was renting in um, Huntington oh. Beach. And, you know, I have a vision of what I want, and I can't get it in Huntington Beach. Okay. <laughs> just can't do it. So I like, found a great home. I'm really excited and I get to move in next week. So it'll be oh, good. Well, congratulations on that. Congratulations on uh, the news last month too. Uh, your, oh, your, you. your promotion. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. How was, I mean, well, what's the feeling with the promotion like that? Cause you've been with the company for so long. So I assume you sort of know the ins and outs and you know, the people, but this is a new role for you. It's sort of, I assume it's different responsibilities and things like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, like everything, it, it'll be a transition. Um, you know, Colin Weatherhead um, has been a great leader. Um, he's going to continue to lead us. Um, he's really, he really sees, he's like a forward thinker and he reads everything. Um, he really does steer the ship for, you know, lack of a better term. Um, and he'll continue in that role. Um, he has already stepped back. So myself and, um, you know, the team really are in the um, the day-to-day -day operations, you know, dealing with, you know, everything that goes on um, with the suppliers and the um, advisors. Um, so in that, it's not going to change. Um, what I am going to have is, um, you know, more decision-making. Um, you know, the, the buck will stop here on um, some things. And then when we need his assistance, um, we'll pull him in. Okay. And so he's going to be the chairman and CEO now. Yeah. So I, I imagine since you started in 1992, right? Correct. Yeah. So, 30 years. March, it was 30 years. Well, how, what was it, what was uh, Montecito like when, what the agency was like when you joined? Do you remember, like, was there a storefront and was there, was it, did it feel different? Um, yeah, so there were storefronts, um, they, and I worked in one of them in Santa Maria. I started as a leisure agent, okay. and um, yeah, so the difference is, um, you know, we we couldn't really work remotely like we can now. So you know, we each each office, and like I said, at one point I think we had 16, 17 offices on the Central Coast. I just happened to work in one of them, okay. and you know, we did. Um, each office was responsible for doing their own ARC report. Um, you know, their own bank deposits, you know, we, you know, had fax machines, um, we had the blue boxes. I mean, I remember, you know, when we got email, we were all like, oh my gosh, what do we do? You know, it's like, <laughs> and now we're all connected with our cell phones. Yeah. And back then we were like, oh no, 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 please don't take the typewriter away. Yeah. Um, you know, so there, you know, as the industry evolved, um, your travel center, Montecito Village Travel evolved too. Um, we, we really for many, many years um, have had independent contractors, you know, and when they were able to go home when the internet came, um, you know, I think we really led that journey, um, especially in California, we were definitely one of the first agencies that had independent contractors. So that's what's different, you know, okay. where you had to have a branch and you had to be registered with ARC, you know, now, you know, we, you can work remotely and virtually we have one ARC number, not 16. You know, I have one set of accounting people that do the ARC, you know, so those, those changes, um, you know, and, and again, we evolved with them. So you mentioned independent contractors and that's something everyone's sort of been talking about in the industry for the past few years. Well, since I've been in the industry is sort of the proliferation of, of that segment of the travel agency community. Um, and you mentioned the internet. Do you think that is the big sort of driving force behind a growing population of independent contractors? Or is, is there something else going on in the workforce that is making that segment more attractive to, to entrants and, and to older advisors who are moving in that direction as well? Um, I, I definitely think that technology and the internet has made it easier um, for people to work remotely. Um, definitely, again, back in the day, we had blue boxes, um, you know, they were on a dial up system, um, you know, so the high speed internet and being able like my workspace when I work from home, I've got, you know, a voice over IP phone, a computer, um, my, I have a corporate staff and they all work from their homes. 
and their phones, um, they can see when each other are on it. So th no different than sitting in an office, right? They can work yeah. as a team because of the technology and the high speed inter internet, you know, obviously has made that um, a, a realistic, you know, to do. Um, and so for the independent contractors, I think it's two things. One, the technology and the internet, definitely. But then also, you know, after 9-11, we saw, um, you know, some of the storefronts and agencies, um, you know, wanting to stay in the business, but really looking at their overhead because business stopped and it didn't come back right away. You know, we, you know, after 9-11, we spent more time, you know, refunding and, you know, the just the financial you know, losses that some of the agencies took, it really let them, um, you know, keep their business. We always said your clients or your clients are there because of you. Um, you know, what we bring to them is our higher upfront commissions, you know, the airline agreements and things. But, you know, if you didn't want to have a storefront because of the overhead expense, um, you could move home without disruption to your clients and your, um, you know, your the way you did business. So I, I think, that, you know, so the times, um, yeah. some of the things that have happened, you know, the commission hits, you know, we rode that wave, we rode 9-11, um, the economic downturn, that was another one that really, you know, some of the agency owners, if you're, you know, anywhere from 3 million to 10 million, you know, to get those higher upfront commissions, to have the airline agreements, mm -hmm. it really became um, unrealistic. So for them to partner with a host and be able to, um, to do that, to service their clients, um, you know, without the overhead and without, you know, having to do their own ARC report, you know, it really, you know, took some of the business part of it away and let them do what they love to sell travel. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting too. I, I think I've considered that before, but that seems like you make the go, you make a good point where you're not really re reaching your, it's going to be very difficult to reach those thresholds without the right. support behind you or without being a part of a host agency, like you said. Right. Um, I mean, is that something you think is going to continue? You think you think the IC community is going to still be growing and strong, like looking to the future? Is that something? Is that a trend you th you really believe in? Yeah, definitely. And um, you know, even if you do have a storefront, um, you know, because there are still you know people that want to you know have their clients come in meet face to face, especially on the luxury. Um, level, you know, when you've got clients spending the kind of money, they want that personal touch and to be able to meet with you. So I do see, you know, smaller agencies that and they can call themselves whatever they want, ABC travel, and then all the inner workings are part of a host, you know, hopefully Montecito Village travel, yeah. but, um, <laughs> you know, part of a host agency. So they are, you know, they have the support that they need on the um, ARC, they have the higher commissions, um, you know, all the waivers and favors, you know, that they may not earn on their own um, as a smaller agency. I definitely see that trend mm. um, continuing. So I know you were you do a lot of work with Aster, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the a, the AB five a few years ago, which seemed was was such a big pre COVID, was one of the biggest issues it seemed like Asta had focused on. Um, when Asta did its work and when we got when the outcome came with AB five, I mean, I, I imagine that was a big deal for the IC community, especially in California because that's where the bill was targeted. But uh, and Montecito has so many in advisors in California, yeah, that I imagine it was a big deal for you all. Yeah, it was huge. Um, it definitely. And, you know, again, Asta did a fantastic job. They're our voice. Um, they took it to the hill. We met in Sacramento. Um, and, you know, really, if we wouldn't have got that exemption, not only would it have hurt the host agencies, but it would have hurt the independent contractors because they wouldn't have been able to continue working in the same manner um, as they were. So um, it was huge. I mean, ASTA, yeah, if you're not a part of ASTA, please, please, please yeah. look into it because they really are our advocacy and our voice. Yeah, and I know ASTA has their legislative day next month, I think, and that's sort of where uh, where a lot of this work gets done. So I, we're, we'll have this episode out before then. So hopefully if advisors are interested in, they can get down to D.C. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'll be there. I, right. I'll, I will be there representing Montecito Village Travel. Yeah. So, so I, I wanted to sort of get your take on the industry. Like we spoke about independent contractors, but... Uh, there seems from where I'm sitting to be a new population of advisors coming into the industry post COVID. I know a lot of people experience like the flexibility 
from COVID and maybe their current career didn't provide that anymore uh, as people are getting back in the office and they're looking for new uh, new ways to make money and new ways to start a career. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if that is that something you're seeing from where you sit? Are you are you seeing new people become interested in, in being travel advisors or travel agency owners? Um, we are, um, we definitely are. And, um, you know, some of it's, it's pretty exciting because some of the people that are coming in are bringing um, new ideas and, you know, new direction to it. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not just, you know, the being an order taker, um, no. they've got some really good um, people that they have built relationships with in other industries. Um, and they're really horning in on those relationships and, you know, filtering it into the travel. And so it's, it's really exciting. I, you know, I'm seeing people come in with business plans that just blow you away. You're like, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah I've so. spoken, I've spoken to a few who are just doing incredible things and are, are looking at the business in a completely different way than I've heard from sort of the population pre COVID. And maybe I wasn't looking for those stories as much pre COVID, but it does seem like you mentioned, like people are coming in with different ways to do business, looking at how their operation is, can be run differently. And like, they're also coming in with a, uh, a, a book of business from exactly. another industry that they can start selling to right away and hit the ground running. Yeah, exactly. They've got those relationships that they are, they're transitioning over with them. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's cool. It's, it's super yeah. cool to see people expanding and the professionalism too, that's coming into the industry. You know, it's, um, to see somebody come in and present a business plan to you, it's it's really a breath of fresh air, definitely. Yeah, we we ran a conference last this this past weekend in Vancouver, and we had, and I was running the booth checking people in, and we I had a couple of people who are who are real estate agents come in and like this telling me this is their first conference. They're looking yeah. to start. Yeah, they're looking to start selling travel. They're looking to start to learn about how to sell travel, and they were just. They they came in looking like for specific information, specific uh, data on how they're going to do this protocols, business building stuff and things like that. So it does. I don't know. It, like you mentioned, it does seem like there's a new there's new faces and new voices, I think, more importantly, that are going to start sort of driving the industry forward. Yeah, no, definitely. And, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, Virtuoso, I was at their symposium um, last month on the Silver Sea Dawn, and they did um, a, a little segment on generations. And um, so I think, you know, we are seeing millennials come in to the business. And I think those are the couple that I've seen business plans for that are fantastic. Um, and, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, so I, um, I was told my role is to um, bridge the, you know, be, you know, we've got baby boomers who are going to work another 10 years, yeah. and they've got experience, they know this industry inside and out. So if I can bridge the baby boomers to the millennials, and we can learn from each other, I mean, I think it's just cool and exciting. Yeah. I, I, I really do. Are there any things that you think uh, or any things or any or pieces of business that the new generation or the millennials, they might not be aware of or, or they find most surprising when they're getting into the business and when you're making that connection to sort of people who can mentor them? Is there anything they desperately need uh, help with or advice uh, going to? Yeah, I think um, I think the biggest challenge for people um, is still air. Okay. I mean, air is, air is a scary beast. Um, you know, I think we've done a great job. We have an air desk and we have an online booking tool that, you know, people who don't know the GDS um, can use and, you know, we'll help them with it. Um, you know, it, every time somebody says, oh, you know, I did, um, you know, this amazing luxury trip and then I had my clients go book their air online, I just want to pull my hair out. I mean, yeah. the, Two things, you know, you never want you, you never want to direct your clients online because if they get comfortable online, then they can book, you know, they may expand what they're booking online. Yeah. That and um, there's a lot of money in air. I mean, you can make some incredible upfront commissions if you're with the right host agency, um, both domestic and international, you know, so to, you know, drive that business away from your own pocket, you know, you really, I, I think they struggle with air. And is, is, does that just come down to how difficult it is or how overwhelming it can be to look into how to book air and how to talk to your clients about air? I mean, like you mentioned, if there's, if it's profitable for them to book, it seems 
it seems the wrong way to go to avoid doing it. Right. And, and it is, I think it's just, again, it's, a, it's an unknown, scary beast, you know, all the rules that the airlines have, um, the changes when they do change, you know, having to deal with them. And, you know, that's, a, we can remove all of that stress from you, you know, you do what you do sell and let us help you with the air. Um, you're going to make money. We're going to make money and your clients are going to be serviced under one umbrella, not, not get comfortable on the internet. Yeah, it does. I mean, when when you started in 90, 90, 1992, was I assume air was a big part of it just seems I don't know, because I wasn't around back then. But it's like when I picture an agency back then, it seems like air was a major component. and It was a big focus for for the sort of the old school advisors. Right. And so, Daniel, which picture are we using of me on this podcast when you're going to be advertising it, right? Because you make, you're making me sound really old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um, no, so right in 1992, there was no internet. So if you wanted an airline ticket, you had to either go to an airline and they had, you know, counters at airports or city locations, we used to call them, or you had to go to a travel agency. Um, so, and we did everything, you know, I, I I used to have to handwrite tickets and call in ticket numbers. And, um, you know, it is obviously a lot more automated now. Yeah. And so we've taken that, you know, we have an online booking tool where they can do the research. Um, we have a QC team that looks at it, make sure that everything's, you know, um, as it should be before they issue the ticket. Um, you know, so again, we try to take the scary out of it, um, you know, for them and make it, you know, easy for them to, um, research and to communicate with their advisor or yeah. with the, for the advisors to communicate with their clients. Yeah, that's yeah, I've heard I've heard a lot about that that discussion about the air. I mean, I had another host agency uh, representative talk to me about that's a, that's the biggest skill that he doesn't think these new agents have is is right. being able to build air. And it, it it does seem to be something that should almost be mandatory for for new agents to to learn how to do when they're coming into the business. Yeah, and back in the day, like I after after college, I went to a travel school, and you know it was six months, and two hours of the day, five days a week, was spent learning the GDS and learning all mm -hmm. about air. And those environments don't exist anymore. Even the GDSs don't have in-person training, so it is very difficult. Um, which is why the online booking tools and like our air desk, you know, I have actual advisors who will you can talk to. Um, they can walk you through. They can you know talk to you about the rules and the changes and all of those um, those things. So, and any good host would have you know hopefully that. Um, again, we would love to have people at Montecito Village travel. So the the people who are on the Montecito help desk, where where did they learn their their sort of air skills from, or, or where did they learn those systems? Were they, where did they go to the travel schools like you? I mean, I'm just because I'm always trying to figure out where people are coming from and where they're sourcing their talents or their skills, and the air seems to be a question mark right now, like you mentioned. Yeah. So um, my air team is made up of um, our corporate team, so they do corporate. And then I just expanded and hired. So I've hired GDS agents who did at you know one point, they either um, sat on a corporate desk um, and I'm having, I, I need people. Um, I think we're all, you know, that's the other issue we're having, you know, for employees, I'm looking for, um, you know, GDS trained agents um, because it is difficult um, to get them. So yes, everybody that's on my team went through some kind of a school and learned um, the GDS and have been with us for a long time. The longevity in our company is, is, is very high. So they've been with us for a long time. They're experienced um, both on the GDS international travel. They know the airline agreements inside and out. Okay. But is there, is there ever a worry, I guess, for your agency, but also for the industry that those skills that this generation has are, are necessarily gonna be passed down because you said there's a, the, the lack of training, the lack of travel schools, things like that? Yes. Yeah, it is. And like I said, I'm struggling right now to find, I need two more, you know, GDS trained okay. agents. I'm struggling to find them right now. So right. Well, yeah, it, it definitely is. And, you know, as the GDS are changing their platforms. Um, so, you know, Travelport is coming out with a new program this year. It should be more user-friendly, more point and click. Um, once they do that, hopefully um, we'll be able to train people easier on that. Um, they're moving away from all the DOS formats, 
which, you know, in people like me um, that have been doing it a long time, you know, we dream about DOS formats, right? And so <laughs> the, the new generation just doesn't, you know, it's okay. totally different. So, you know, hopefully to, um, as we're moving, you know, into the new generation of people coming on, the GDS are going to become more user friendly and they are going to have that point and click environment that will, um, you know, it, 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 then it's going to be, again, another double-edged sword, right? It might be easier for the new people coming in, but the people that we have that have been on a GDS and a DOS, you know, it's going to, we're going to have to bridge them into the new platform also. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned business sort of exploding or business being back for quicker than you, than you expected. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, what are you seeing about demand now from clients? Because I know there's a lot of these financial headlines about a possible downturn in the economy coming, but I know the travel companies, I've, I've listened to their uh, earnings calls and they all seem, they all seem to see a pretty healthy consumer right now. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic, um, we're seeing two things, you know, one, the pent up demand, they haven't been able to go anywhere. Um, and, you know, the economy, the last, you know, four years was good. So they, yeah. you know, through the pandemic, they didn't spend any money. Um, so they've got money and they've got time because they didn't take, you know, time off. So we're seeing, you know, people spending more money, staying longer, maybe doing more countries than they would have. Um, we're seeing a lot of that this year. You know, as we move through into the third and fourth quarter, you know, if the economy starts to um, change and, and drop, um, you know, we may see a slowdown in that. Um, you know, the thing about Americans, it's, it's, we're entitled and we're entitled to vacation. We like to travel. So, um, you know, I, I don't see anything, you know, critical happening. I, you know, I, I do think it's an anomaly right now, the money that's being spent and the length of time they're going. Um, so that may change. If people are going to travel. It just may not be to the extent that we're seeing this year. Yeah, I, I remember during the pandemic, there was a lot of uh, thought and, and sort of headlines, too, about uh, the ways Americans and North Americans are, are traveling is going to be different. They want these bucket list destinations and, th and things like that. But then I, I remember getting the data from USTOA at the end of the year and the top European destinations were still the top European destinations for Americans. And I'm curious if that is that what you you're seeing, too, are the sort of the the stalwarts remaining on top of those kind of lists? Yeah, definitely. Um, I just I had a conversation with an advisor yesterday that just got back from Italy on Sunday, and she was like, "It was Italy of 2018-19." She oh, wow. said it was, it was amazing. You know, the streets were you know a hustle and bustle, and people were out. The markets were full. She, you know, really great. You know, good to see and feel and to yeah. be out of it. Yeah, and so I mean, I know you're in the middle of a move right now, but I'm sure you have a bucket list or you have plans you want to pursue uh, when you're when you're able when you're sort of when you have the time. I guess would be the best yeah. uh, way to put it. Uh, yeah, I mean, anything you want to anything you feel comfortable sharing? Um, yeah, so in the fall, um, I'm hoping to get to Peru. Um, I want to do Machu Picchu, okay. um, and uh, I, I have an opportunity to do that. I also am really interested in doing Egypt. So I. Um, and I have an advisor that's got a group um, actually on an Alma uh, River cruise um, in 2024 that I'm going to jump on. And then anything in between that comes up. But those yeah. are my two, you know, that I'm like really looking forward to, um, you know, and I'll go to Europe anytime. I love Europe, you know, so but yeah, so Machu Picchu and um, okay. with Belmont, hopefully in the fall. That's okay. what I'm going to do. So yeah. I'll write it up and, and send you some stuff on it, Daniel. Yeah, I would love that, to be honest. I'd love to hear about yeah. that. Um, it, those, it, and uh, Alma seems like a good or River Cruise even seems like a good way to see Egypt as well, because I know everyone probably flocks to Cairo. Uh, yeah. when they think about Egypt, but I'm sure that country has a lot more to offer than just than just Cairo. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. well, I want to say thanks for talking to me. I know it was a quick conversation, but uh, I really I really did enjoy and hearing about the air, too. I, I I I really wonder what the sort of the future of that segment when it comes to the travel advisors role is going to be, because I, I you, like you mentioned and like other people have mentioned to me, it does seem like something the industry is either going to have to tackle or, or something that it's going to have to find its way 
its way out. Yeah, and, and, and I do think the GDSs, like I said, are addressing it. They're going to make them more user-friendly, you know, and hopefully it'll be easier for us to train the new people coming in. But yeah, yeah we just don't send your clients to the internet. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I know, because once once the internet knows what you're searching for, too, it's a, it's a bad place to be. Exactly. If they get comfortable doing air on the internet, you know, who knows, they yeah. cruise and everything else. So you don't want to do that. You want to service your client from door to door. All right. Well, Robin, again, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'm sure I'll see you in Washington, D.C. next month. And hopefully we'll see a lot of travel advisors uh, yeah. there as well. Great. Thank you. And thank you for everything you guys are doing. You really have kept everybody informed, you know, during the last two years. So we really appreciate you. All right. Thank you. Thank, thanks again. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Bye.